Thanks, Ben. Well, good morning, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Slade Reinhardt. I'm the uh, Director of Youth Ministry and Discipleship here at Fellowship. <clears throat> and it's my honor this morning to bring you the fourth message in our series called the Pentateuch. And uh, as you've heard multiple times, but I'll go ahead and say it again, the Pentateuch refers to the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Uh, if you're not already there, you can go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 32. As you heard Ben just read, we'll be going through that. I'm actually going to go through the entire chapter, but because it was so long, I, I asked him just to read about half of it. When you, uh, when you think of the word rebellion, does it bring up good or bad connotations in your mind? Suppose, for instance, that you're living in a peaceful republic where the citizens are well cared for and protected. And in the Senate of this republic, a man begins to rise in influence. We'll call him Paul Patin. And over time, he gains influence and begins consolidating power to the point where eventually he declares himself emperor, disbands the Senate, and begins ruthlessly getting rid of his opponents. Now, what would be the righteous response to such a ruler? <laughs> it would be, rebellion would be the righteous response uh, to such a thing. You could even call yourselves the rebellion, get a princess and a Wookiee and a smuggler <clears throat> together and start working against them. Uh, of course, uh, that's uh, part of our uh, cultural myth, mythology here in the United States, knowing the uh, overall story arc of the, especially the original trilogy of Star Wars. <clears throat> Now, like I said, that kind of rebellion would have been a good kind because uh, Paul Patin was an, an evil, maniacal ruler. But if, on the other hand, there was a good ruler who was caring for his people, who did love and desire the best for them, then rebellion against that ruler would, of course, be iniquity and wickedness. And as you heard Ben just read a few uh, minutes ago, <clears throat> the rebellion we're going to be looking at in Exodus 32 is that kind. It is an awful, wicked, and uh, sinful rebellion. Now, in just a minute, I'm going to give you the context of the passage so you have a little backdrop for what's happening. Uh, but before I do that, I want to, just by way of reminder, help you to orient your minds correctly. Uh, I believe that the primary purpose of Scripture is to reveal God to us. Who He is, what He is like, what He has done, uh, what He expects, that kind of thing. A secondary purpose of Scripture is to reveal us to us. Mankind's origin and purpose and nature and how mankind is supposed to relate to God. So as we go through this passage, two things I want you to kind of be looking for, especially as I'm reading the scriptures directly, is what does this reveal about God and what does this reveal about humanity? Because both of those are important to living our lives. They're uh, interconnected. Uh, okay, so let's get caught up on the context of Exodus chapter 32. As you know, Moses, excuse me, is... I'll get the right name in a second. God. We'll keep going up. <clears throat> God delivered Israel from Egypt through a bunch of miracles, through a mighty hand, an outstretched arm, as the Bible puts it. And then uh, once he led them out of e Egypt, he led them into the wilderness. And for two months, they traveled until they came to the base of Mount Sinai. Now, while they were at Mount Sinai, they camped. And God called Moses up onto the mountain. And then God gave to Moses what we call the Mosaic Covenant. It consisted of the Ten Commandments as well as some of the basic rules for, uh, to govern Israel as a nation. Now, after he gave him that, Moses came back down from the mountain and delivered it to the people. In Exodus 24, 3, it says this. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And the very next day, Moses sacrificed oxen to the Lord, and then he read that covenant to them again. And this time they responded, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. Then Moses took some of the blood from those oxen that he had just killed, and he threw it on the people of Israel as a way of sealing or ratifying the covenant. So now Israel was in covenant with Yahweh. 
He was bound to them, and they were bound to him. After the covenant was sealed, God called Moses back up onto the mountain and began giving him instructions for how to build the tabernacle, which, of course, would be the place where God would meet them and would be the center of their worship of the one true God. However, this time when Moses went up on the mountain, he was up there for 40 days. 40 days. So it was, it was quite a long stretch for, for Israel to be without their leader. And that's the backdrop of what we're just about to see here in chapter 32. All this time has passed. All these events have occurred. And then this happens. Now, when chapter 32 begins, actually, we roll back in time just a little bit. Uh, probably Moses has been on the, on the uh, mountain for 30 to 35 days. Now, the story in this chapter takes place in four scenes, and we're just going to look at them each in turn and see what that reveals to us. In the first scene, Israel sins against the Lord. Israel sins against the Lord. Look with me again at verse 1. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt... We do not know what has become of him. From our perspective, this is unthinkable. It is unthinkable that five or six weeks after Israel as a people gathered before God and said, everything that God said, we will do. We will obey. We will enter into covenant with him. He will be our God. We will be his people. And then this happens. Less than two months after the covenant with God was sealed, less than two months after being, the ten com- being given the Ten Commandments, the second of which says, you shall not make any graven image. And then in Exodus 20, God said, you shall not make gods of silver to be with me, nor shall you make for yourself gods of gold. And here they are demanding that Aaron make gods for them. They said specifically that they wanted gods to go before them. In other words, to lead them. Moses had been leading them, but he's up on the mountain and they suspect that he's dead. They kind of put it euphemistically. We don't know what's become of him, but he's been up there for so long, they suspect that he's dead. He's never coming back. So their request was either born out of fear that they had lost their leader and so they needed another one, or impatience from sitting around for so long and going nowhere. Either way, of course, it was high treason against God. Now think about what had happened up to this point. They spent centuries in slavery in Egypt. And then when they were delivered out of slavery, what did they have to do to deliver themselves? Anybody? Nothing. Yeah, so that was the right answer, to say nothing. (laughs) They did nothing to deliver themselves. God did all of the work. He sent the plagues upon Egypt. He's the one that drove Pharaoh to eventually tell Moses... Take them, you can take whatever spoils you want, and get out of of Egypt. So after God delivered them out of slavery by his miraculous power, while they were on their way away from Egypt, Pharaoh changed his mind, as you know, and he sent his army to run after them. God opens the sea in front of Israel. They cross the sea, and then behind them he closes the sea and drowns the entire Egyptian army. After they left, or excuse me, after that point, they saw several more miracles. They saw bitter water that was turned sweet miraculously. They got food literally from heaven. Every morning they would wake up and there's food all over the place. All they had to do was collect it. And then right before this particular instance, they came to a place that didn't have water and God miraculously brought water out of a rock. So don't you think that by this point, God has earned the right in Israel's eyes to be trusted and to be obeyed. Now, God is God, so he doesn't have to earn that right. But don't you think he's given them plenty of reasons to say, okay, I don't know what's happening, but God has really shown that he cares for us and that he's able to provide. Well, of course, the answer is yes. All of us would answer that. But think about a different question. Do you believe that this would have turned out differently If God had called a different people to be his people. Instead of the nation of Israel. If God had called the Belgians to be his people. They make great waffles. Or think about this. What if God had called Texans? I'm going to make Texans my covenant people. Would that have turned out differently? Would we have been faithful? We'd never turn away from God. Well of course we know the answer is no. It would not have turned out differently if God had called any other people. It's not like Israel was worse than anyone else in the world. 
The problem is that we all have a sin nature and therefore we are hardwired to turn away from God and to trust in someone or something else. Even if God had chosen a different people, the same result would have occurred. Israel is a picture of all of humanity here. It's easy for us to look down on them for this bold-faced sin, but think about your own life. Every believer in here also has been provided with untold reasons to trust God, untold evidences of his love and care. And how often do we give in to the same temptation? We get into trouble. Things aren't going the way we want them. God doesn't seem to be coming through until we turn to something else to deliver us. <clears throat> Israel was either demanding new gods. Now, this part actually isn't clear from the text, so commentators tend to be divided. When they say, make us gods to go before us, we're not sure if they were saying, well, we just need new gods because we can't trust Yahweh anymore, and so they're going to fall back into the, the paganism that they spent uh, surrounded by in Egypt. Or they were saying, we want to follow Yahweh, and Moses was our visible representative. He's gone, so make us another visible representative of Yahweh. Either way, of course, it was grievous sin because God had just told them, do not do that. So look at what happened next, verses 2 through 5. So Aaron said to them, now uh, Aaron was left in charge by Moses when Moses went on the mountain. Aaron was Moses' brother. Aaron would be the first high priest of the nation of Israel. So here we go. They're going to their spiritual leader, this man who knows God, this man who has joined Moses on the mountain before and eaten with in the presence of God. And what does he say? Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters and bring them to me. So while the people took off the rings of gold, they were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. So Aaron was faced with a problem. The people that he was leading came to him, probably in mass, and they made a demand that he knew was wrong. So Aaron had a choice to make. He could either risk the wrath and the anger of these people that he was leading to stand up for what is right, or he could compromise on what is right in the hopes that he could manage the situation and perhaps prevent it from being as bad as it could be. Well, of course, we know the answer. He didn't rebuke them. He told them to provide gold to make the idol. He actually oversaw and facilitated them entering into this sin rather than facing it head on and opposing this ungodly request. He takes up a collection of gold, makes a golden calf. Now, this is interesting. In the ancient Near East, it was actually common practice for uh, pagans to build an idol of their god standing on top of an animal. An animal would act as a pedestal for this God to, so that he was somewhat lifted up and to demonstrate his, his authority uh, over nature, I would assume. <clears throat> so it's possible that Aaron was thinking this. Okay, I'm going to build an, a, an animal. I'm going to build this golden calf. And it will be, in a sense, the pedestal for our invisible God, Yahweh. So it's perhaps the case that Aaron was trying to manage the situation. Okay, I'll go this far, but we'll still be pointing back to Yahweh because I'm not going to put any deity standing on top of this calf. And of course, if that was his plan, it didn't work. The people focused on the calf and said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. Now, again, there's no explanation for us to know whether the Israelites are now saying this is a new God or if the Israelites are saying this represents Yahweh. Either way, it was, of course, high-handed rebellion against the commands of God. Now, Aaron, when he sees them receiving this calf as their new God... Again, he tries to sort of manage the situation. So he says, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pro proclaim a feast to the Lord. And he uses the covenant name there, Yahweh. So again, he's trying to point them back to the one true God. Okay, we're going to have a feast. We've got this idol here. But, but we're going to be thinking about Yahweh when we're uh, sacrificing before this golden calf. So he made an altar to make that possible. He may be thinking that by directing them back to Yahweh that he can prevent them from running headlong into idolatry. He may be thinking that if he sort of manages the situation, they won't break out into outright rebellion. We can't say for sure, but we can say that he compromised with sin. 
He did what God explicitly said not to do. He's an example of a spiritual leader who compromises for what he thinks is the greater good. It shows the foolishness of the idea that we can manage sin. Sin needs to be killed and not managed. So it ends this way in this first scene, verse 6. And they rose up early the next day. And this, it's so interesting to me that, that they added early to this. Because as you know, all of us here, worshipers of the one true God... You think about Sunday morning, how many of you are just bouncing out of bed? I just can't wait to get there and worship God with my people. Well, most of us aren't, right? I mean, that's, that's, not, that's just not human nature. But here they are being offered the chance to worship this false God. And because of their sin nature stirred up within them, they are enthusiastic and eager to do it. And they even got up early so they could do that. So they rose up early the next day, offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings and then it ends this way, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. So Aaron's feast day to Yahweh does include offerings. Again, I'm sure he's saying this is for Yahweh. This is for the one true God. We're offering him worship. But instead of drawing their hearts back to the true Lord, it incites them to go deeper in pagan worship. When it says that they rose up to play, the implication is that they were engaging in sexual immorality. They've thrown off all moral restraint and they give in to their sinful desires. Again, probably copying the patterns of worship that they saw in Egypt where they had been for several hundred years. In violating God's command related to worship, they opened the floodgates of their iniquity. So after this description of Israel's sin, the scene changes. And in the second sin, the Lord responds to Israel's sin. While this rebellion against God is happening in the camp, Moses is in the presence of God on the mountain. He's receiving instructions for the tabernacle. And you can see the, the great irony there, right? God is giving Moses instructions for this is how I will meet with you. This is how you will worship me. And down in the camp, Israel is worshiping a false god. Israel's running <clears throat> hard away from God. So God interrupts these instructions to give Moses an update on the people. Look at verses 7 and 10. And the Lord said to Moses, go down, for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I command them, commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people and behold, it is a stiff necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. God's response to Israel's sin is white hot anger. Your people have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly from my commandments. And he reveals what's really going on. They aren't worshiping God by proxy through this calf. They're worshiping the calf. They're sacrificing to the calf. This is one of the reasons that God was so adamant that his people not use visible objects as stand-ins for him in their worship. Because the human heart will always be drawn to give its affection or its worship to the stand-in instead of the one true God. One of the reasons that, that we as Protestants do not have images of Christ or images of the apostles in this worship center is because as people begin to use an image as a proxy for their worship, eventually the worship gets drawn to the image itself. God regards this evil turn as an indicator of the character of the people of Israel. He says that I've seen them and they are stiff-necked. Now, stiff-necked means stubborn or rebellious. It comes from a farm life where if you were going to put a yoke on an animal, if that animal didn't want to be yoked, it would stiffen its neck to try to resist that yoke so that you could not... Of course, control it. So God's saying in the same way, Israel is resisting my yoke. They're resisting my rule. They're pushing against my leadership. <clears throat> People that do not want to submit to God are stiff-necked against God's yoke. In his anger against their sin, God threatens to destroy Israel except for Moses and make a nation from him. Now, what, what do these verses reveal to us about God? That he hates sin. Absolutely hates sin. When the pure, unadulterated holiness of God comes into contact with the sinfulness of man, the result is wrath. Wrath against that which is unrighteous and wrong. 
<clears throat> the lives of the people of Israel were now on the line. The Almighty God was threatening to destroy them all, except for Moses and his family, and to start again. Thankfully, Moses responded, starting in verse 11, and it says this, But Moses implored the Lord God, the Lord his God, and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent did he bring them out, to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham and Isaac and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have promised I will give to your offspring and they shall inherit it forever. Moses responds to this drastic threat from God by interceding for his people. It's a beautiful picture of a godly leader going before God on behalf of those he leads. Notice that when God spoke to Moses about what was happening, he said, your people that you brought out of the land of Israel. And when Moses prays, he turns that around and, God, and he says, God, these are your people that you brought out of the land of Egypt. And I think what's going on is this. When God was talking to Moses, he wanted Moses to identify with the people of Israel. And then when Moses was praying back to God, he wanted God to identify with the people of Israel to stir up his compassion. It's as if Moses is saying, Lord, these are your people, not mine. You brought them out of the land of Egypt, not me. Moses' love for Israel and his love for God to combine to fuel a passionate appeal for God to spare Israel. He gives three reasons to the Lord to spare them. First, he says, you brought them out of Egypt. God, look, what, look at all that you did to bring them to this point. You don't want that to be for nothing. You delivered this people. And then he adds that it would cause the Egyptians to mock you. The Egyptians would say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Their God delivered them, and then he brought them out and destroyed them. And then he brings up the covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, or, uh, which is another name for Jacob. Moses appeals to God's reputation and to his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's a tender picture of selfless love because Moses laying on the table before him is the opportunity to be the father of the nation. He could have said, man, yeah, I've been dealing with these people for months. That's a good plan, God. Let's just start over. I'm your man. But because of his love for the people of Israel, and again, because of his love for the glory of God, he wouldn't allow that to happen. It also points toward an even greater leader who intercedes for his people. Hebrews 7.25 says this about Jesus. He is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Moses, like Jesus, prayed for his people, and God responded. Look at verse 14. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. The Lord relented. In response to Moses' intercession, the Lord decides not to destroy Israel. God is both just and merciful. He hates sin, but he has mercy on sinful humanity. Now, one question this episode often raises in the minds of, of uh, believers is whether God truly changed his mind or if he was just testing Moses. In other words, did God sincerely make this offer that he would destroy Israel and start over with Moses. Well, I believe that God's threat was genuine. I believe he would have done just that if Moses had not interceded. It is true that God knew exactly what Moses would do. He knows the end from the beginning. He does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth. Scripture is clear on that. But scripture is also clear that prayer affects God's actions. And we can't completely understand that, but we can accept it and live in light of it. For instance, in James 4.2, uh, James speaking to believers says, You do not have because you do not ask. In other words, there are things that God would have done for you. There are things that God would have provided for you if you had asked. But you didn't ask. So he didn't. I believe God's intent to destroy Israel was real. It was a sincere threat. Just as his threat to destroy Nineveh in the book of Jonah was a sincere threat. In both instances, he relented of the threatened judgment... In Jonah, it was the repentance of the Ninevites that averted their destruction. In Exodus 32, it was the intercession of Moses that averted Israel's destruction. So, all that to say, I don't have a full answer for exactly what's going on here. But let me just encourage you to rest and rejoice in the sovereignty of God. But don't use it 
as a uh, motivation to not pray for something. God was ready to consume Israel and start over with Moses. Moses prayed for God to spare them, and God did spare them. In fact, it's a glorious lesson in the power of intercession, the power of praying for someone else. Now, at this point, it feels like the story is climaxed, right? Israel did this terrible thing. God got really angry and said, I'm going to wipe them off the face of the earth. Moses interceded, and then God said, okay, we'll let them go on. But we're not done yet. That's only the end of scene two. So in the next scene, Moses confronts Israel's sin. After this dramatic encounter with the Lord on the mountain, pleading for the very existence of the people that he led, Moses heads down the mountain to confront Israel's sin. Starting in verse 15, it says, Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand. Tablets that were written on both sides, on the front and on the back they were written. The tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. And that's going to be important in just a minute because he's, he's trying to set up just how precious these objects are that he's carrying. Carved by God himself, engraved by God himself. When Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. But he said, Moses said, It is not the sound of shouting for victory or the sound of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing that I hear. So Moses meets up with Joshua on his way back down the mountain. Apparently he was waiting for him at the base. And they head back to the camp. And as they get close, they hear all this noise. And Joshua can only think, wow, something bad is happening here. They're in a battle. But Moses knows better. Moses knows it's actually the sound of sinful celebration that was going on. So he heads into camp and he confronts it. Verse 19. As soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing... Moses' anger burned hot. Now, remember what happened on the mountain. God stopped the, uh, uh, giving instructions to Moses about the tabernacle to tell him what Israel had done. And it says that uh, God's anger burned hot. And Moses interceded for them. Well, now when Moses sees it for his own eyes, his anger burns hot. And it says he threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. Moses was, was so filled with righteous anger at what Israel was doing, he decided to make an object lesson for them. And just as Israel was enthusiastically and openly and unashamedly breaking God's law, Moses took God's law in his hands and smashed the tablets on the ground to show Israel what they were doing. Verse 20 says, he took the calf they had made and burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it on the water and made the people of Israel drink it. Now, this, to me, this is just amazing, the thoroughness with which Moses attacks this, okay? So he is so upset at seeing this golden calf. He's like, okay, melt it down, and they do that. Okay, grind it to powder, and they do that. And then he mixes it in water and makes the people drink it. As if to finally show them the absolute foolishness of worshiping an idol. You think this idol is something? You think this idol delivered you from Egypt? You're going to drink this idol. You're going to taste the bitterness of your sin. So Moses <clears throat> confronts this sin, of the, the visible sin that Israel had committed in the, the form of this calf. And then he turns to his brother Aaron. Verse 21. And Moses said to Aaron... What did this people do to you that you have brought such a great sin upon them? And Aaron said, let not the anger of my Lord burn hot. He can tell Moses is angry. <laughs> I bet. You know the people. So, okay. So here's Aaron. Remember Adam and Eve in the garden? Okay. What have you guys done? What did, what did Adam say? That lady that you made for me, she led me into this sin. So there's Eve. And what did she say? That snake. That snake led me into the sin. Well, Aaron does the same thing. It's like Moses confronts him. What in the world were you doing? You led the people into sin. And he was like, Moses, you know these people. They're terrible. Israel's terrible. What can I do? They're set on evil. And then his, his second defense is even more ridiculous. They said to me, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And here it is, the lamest story in the history of lame stories. So I said to them, let any who have gold take it off. So they gave it to me, and I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. 
I'm completely innocent in this matter. I just threw their gold in the fire. I don't know. And this calf pops out. It is astounding that he went there. I'm sure Aaron was absolutely terrified that Moses was going to run him through with a sword or something after seeing what he did to that calf. Uh, but Aaron didn't stand up to the people. He didn't stand up for God. And ultimately then he was not caring for the people that he was supposed to be leading. In his compromise to give them what they wanted, he was actually giving them what they did not need and helping them further down the path of sin. <clears throat> so finally, after confronting the calf and destroying it, confronting Aaron and reproving him, now it gets really serious as Moses confronts the people, verses 25 to 29. And when Moses saw that the people had broken loose, and that again is speaking of their immoral conduct, they were just going wild uh, having some kind of wild uh, frat party. Uh, when they, Moses had seen that the people had broken loose, and remember this is partly Aaron's fault, for Aaron had let them break loose to the derision of their enemies. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. And all the people of Levi, Levi gathered around him. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Put your sword on your side, each of you, and go to and fro from gate to gate throughout the camp, and each of you kill his brother and his companion and his neighbor. And the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and that day about 3,000 men of the people fell. So Moses calls everyone to his side that will still stand up for the one true God, and it's his kinsmen. He's from the tribe of Levi. It's the people of Levi that come join him. And then in response to a command that apparently God had given him while he was on the mountain, he says, okay, what we have to do is go through the camp and kill. Now, who were they killing? They didn't kill everybody. There were 3,000 people that died. So all we can infer from this is that he, he, he was killing those who would not repent of this sin and say, okay, I'll, I'll turn back to God. I, I, I'll stop, basically. He's killing the ones who are entrenched in their sin and saying, no, I want to follow that golden calf. I reject Yahweh. And so they did that. At the end of the day, can you imagine how the people of Israel were feeling? Reproved, absolutely shamed, feeling at the very bottom of the valley for what they have done before God and to God and to God's law. And then they had to bury 3,000 of their relatives who refused to submit to the rulership of God. It highlights the seriousness of sin and the need to be ruthless, even brutal, in our fight against sin. Again, sin cannot be managed. It cannot be compromised with. It has to be faced head on and it has to be killed. So now we move to the final scene. <clears throat> Moses asks the Lord to forgive Israel's sin. The next day Moses said to the people, You have sinned a great sin. And now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people has sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. But now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. In yet another foreshadowing of Christ, Moses literally offers himself to atone for Israel's sin. Remember, he told the Israelites, Perhaps I can make atonement for you. Verse 32 shows that what he offered was his life. Lord, if you won't forgive them just for me asking, then blot me out of your book. Take me out. Strike me from your list. Condemn me. I'll take the hit for them. Give me the punishment that they deserve. Again, you see the, the beautiful foreshadowing of what Christ would do. But this time, the Lord does not grant Moses' request. Verses 33 and 35, it says, But the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. But now go, lead the people to the place about which I've spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. Then the Lord sent a plague on the people because they made the calf, the one that Aaron made. So Moses offered himself as atonement for Israel. But God didn't accept that. Now, why wouldn't God accept that? There are probably a hundred reasons. But one reason is that Moses was not perfect himself. 
Moses couldn't atone for the sin of others because he was not a perfect sacrifice. And in addition to that, he was a single man and the worth of his own giving of his own life. What would that be worth? One more life, right? It would hardly do atonement for an entire nation. And this might surprise you, but in general, the scriptures teach that vicarious punishment, in other words, punishing someone else on your behalf, <clears throat> won't be accepted. Here in Ezekiel 18, God says, the one who sins against me, that's who will be punished. Psalm 49, 7 and 8 says, truly no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life, for the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice. Praise be to God, there is one exception to this rule, and that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's one man in all of human history who could atone for the sins of others, and I'll get to that in just a minute. So even though the Lord rejected Moses' offer of atonement, he did tell Moses to return the people and that he would continue leading them, except <clears throat> he mentions that his angel will go before them. In other words, my presence with you will not be as close. I'm going to be more distant. And he adds a promise of disciplinary action. He says that he will come close to them to visit their sin upon them. The people that refused to return to the Lord were killed, but the nation had whole, as a whole had sin. So God promised that there was still some punishment coming for that sin that was remaining. <clears throat> and that la the last verse explains that discipline. God sent a plague on the people. Now, chapter two in, excuse me, chapter 32 ends on that somber note, which is, I think, fitting because it is a very somber story of rebellion against God, and uh, it highlights a problem. Basically, the point of this message, the point of this, this chapter, is a problem between God and man. And the problem is this. We're sinful, and God is holy, therefore he can't dwell with us. Just as Israel needed someone, <clears throat> excuse me, to intercede between them and God, we need someone to intercede between us and God. Just as Israel needed their sin atoned for, we need our sin atoned for. God could not dwell in close proximity with Israel because they were unfaithful and unholy. In fact, in the next chapter, Exodus 33, 5, God said to Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. So that's why he sent this angel to mediate his presence. He's saying, if I, if I come down there and manifest my presence to you, I'm going to destroy you because you're sinful. So we cannot dwell in close proximity. And Israel's problem is our problem. We were created by God in God's image for the purpose of knowing and glorifying him. Our highest purpose, our highest happiness, our greatest satisfaction and pleasure is found in union with God and knowing and walking with the living God. <clears throat> but we're sinful. We're unholy. God's nearness would only bring us wrath and destruction, which is why, for instance, in Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah saw the Lord manifest his presence, he said, Woe is me! I am a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. What he's saying is, I am sinful, and pure, blazing holiness is now manifesting itself before me. And I know if those two come into contact, I'll be destroyed. I cannot be close to God. But in his merciful plan for humanity, God provided a solution to that problem. <clears throat> the solution is this. Only Jesus can atone for our sin and bring us close to God. As great a man as Moses was, as fantastic a leader as Moses was, he could not atone for even the sin of one person because he was not perfect. Jesus, on the other hand, was perfect. 1 Peter 2, 22 says he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. He perfectly obeyed all of God's rules all of his life. Scripture repeatedly calls Jesus the Holy One. He is the one man who lived in perfect holiness, completely set apart from sin, completely set apart for obedience to the Father. <clears throat> and then you add to that the fact that Jesus is more than a man. Because again, even if he was a perfect man, he could only atone for one life. But Jesus, thank the Lord, is more than a man. He is God in the flesh. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, speaking of Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Colossians 1.19 says that all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell 
in Christ. Because Jesus is fully God, he can atone for our sin. He has no sin of his own, and his sacrifice, his giving of himself, is of infinite worth. Jesus, and only Jesus, can atone for our sin. 1 John 4.10 says, In this is love, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and gave himself to be the propitiation for our sins. <clears throat> that means that Jesus takes away the wrath of God by offering himself as the sacrifice for our sins. So now, because of Jesus, we can dwell with God. God can come near to us and even dwell within us. Man's great problem is resolved by God's great solution. Only Jesus can atone for our sin and bring us close to God. So what do we do with that? Where do we go from here? Well, I have a few ideas for responding to God's word today. First of all, you can praise God for providing atonement for your sin and bringing you close to him. If you have trusted Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, then that means you have experienced both of those truths. Your sin has been atoned for. It has been covered. It has been washed away. It has been forgiven. It will never be used against you. It is not used as a basis for God's relationship to you. It is gone. And in addition to that, you have been brought near to God. You have been brought into union with the living God. His Holy Spirit has come to dwell within you. Praise Him for that today. Secondly... You can intercede for someone that you know that doesn't know Christ. The people of Israel were blessed with a godly leader who prayed on their behalf. And if you're a believer, then you have people in your life who have that same blessing. They have someone, that someone being you, who is in their life, who knows the living God, who can go to the living God on their behalf. Think of a specific person or two or three and pray for them this week. Pray for the Lord to convict them of their sin and convince them that Jesus will forgive them and bring them close if they'll put their faith in him. And finally, you can intercede for a fellow believer who is backsliding. As shown very powerfully in this passage, even those who know God are capable of turning to sin. Now, we all know fellow believers who have wandered, who have, as the Bible calls it, backslid, who have drawn back, fallen away, drifted away from the Lord. <clears throat> Maybe they uh, are living in an immoral relationship. Maybe they're angry at God and they've stopped attending corporate worship or they've withdrawn from their church relationships. Pray for the Lord to turn them around. Pray for his spirit to move on their heart, to draw them back to a place of repentance and restoration. Now, before I close in prayer, Keep in mind that there will be men and women up here at the front of the stage that are available to pray with you. So if you have any need, any burden, any question, if you want to know the Lord and you don't know him, any one of these people would be overjoyed to pray with you. Uh, if you're going through a hard time and you just need some encouragement, they'll be happy to pray for you about that as well. Let's all stand. <clears throat> Heavenly Father... In the name of your son, Jesus, our mediator, I come before you and I thank you, Lord. I thank you for that undeserved mercy and grace that you extended to us. I thank you that you gave us a mediator, a savior, a man who was also God, who would stand between us and your wrath, who would satisfy all the righteous requirements of the law and who would then give us his righteousness just for trusting in him. He would give us forgiveness of sins just for trusting in him. He would adopt us into your family just for trusting in him. God, I pray that everyone in here that knows you, that their hearts would be filled again with joy at that thought, that the, the wonder of the new birth, of new creation, of salvation would spring up in their minds and hearts. And Lord, for any who don't know you, I pray that your spirit would convince them that they are lost and undone without you. That they are rebels in need of laying down their arms and submitting to the one true king. And that if they will do so, Jesus stands ready to save them. Lord, I also pray a special prayer for any right now who are going through a deep trial. Lord, the, the Israelites were faced with something very minor. It was just 40 days of waiting and in their hearts, they turned away from you by and large. Lord, I, I know that that temptation is even stronger when 
Month after month or year after year, a trial continues. I pray, Lord, for the downtrodden, downcast, despairing believer in this room, that you would reach out to your child and encourage them with your strong love. Encourage them that you're still with them. And bless them, God, with the grace that they need. In your holy name, I pray. Prayer team, if you would come forward. And the rest of you, you are dismissed. God bless you. Have a great week.